it, it's a real honor to speak to you uh, today. Thanks for the invitation, Marilyn, Jim, and the rest of the CDF. Thanks a lot. Um, I'm going to tell you about the rationale for AMG714. It's a, it's a new experimental medication which offers a lot of promise in celiac disease. I will also do an overview of, of medications in development for celiac. My disclosures, as mentioned, I, I started Celimune. I worked at Alba. Celimune now belongs to Amgen, and Amgen, as a local Los Angeles, Thousand Oaks company, is playing a very important role in celiac disease. One of the CDF members, Kristen Jarema, really played a big role at, oh, there you are. Kristen, sitting right here, played a big role at enabling the um, studies that, that I'll tell you about. Um, I am from Spain, and uh, all of these gluten detecting tools from biometal, from glutenostics, were originated in Spain. One of the anecdotes I always tell is that when I moved to the US and I began to work at the NIH, I was informed that uh, there was no celiac in the US, so I should <laughs> switch to IBD to work in Crohn's disease, and I did. I, I believed it initially until the uh, Fasano article, and then I realized I had been cheated and I went back to celiac. <laughs> um, now that um, Amgen has uh, decided to take the lion's share of the development of this drug, I uh, started a new company called Prevention Bio, and we are developing a vaccine for type 1 diabetes and potentially celiac disease. So the first thing that people always ask is, do celiac patients need a medication? Because why does a patient need a medication if they could just avoid gluten? And years ago, every time I would speak at a conference, half of the audience would come afterwards and tell me that I was unethical for developing medicines for celiac disease because there was absolutely no need. This was just greedy pharma. Then I will go back to pharma and my boss will tell me, if you don't stop working on celiac disease, we're gonna fire you because we don't want medicines for celiac disease because nobody's gonna buy them because you have the diet. So it was a conundrum until recently when finally it was, became very clear that celiac patients need something else than the diet in some cases, not always. If you can really avoid gluten, that's perfect. You don't need a medication. But we know that it's extremely difficult to do so. What Jennifer and others were telling us today, Janelle and uh, all the nutritionists, it's so hard to avoid gluten. So unfortunately, at any given time, half of all celiac patients on a gluten-free diet continue to have complete mucosal atrophy in their gut. That's a fact. When patients are asked, and this was a Dr. Guandalini presentation, what do they want from the pharmaceutical industry? It surprised us initially that the majority of patients said they want a drug to protect from cross-contamination. It was not that they wanted to necessarily eat a lot of gluten, but if they are doing the effort to follow the gluten-free diet, they want to know the diet is really effective. So that's what we are developing. Celiac is caused by gluten consumption, and we know um, it's the first autoimmune disease where we know the source of the uh, autoimmune process. Gluten peptides getting into the gut wall, being modified by an enzyme transglutaminase, presented to the T cells, and that triggers a whole cascade. There are some important lymphocytes or immune cells in between the pinky cells, the epithelial cells, they are called intraepithelial lymphocytes, and they are activated by interleukin-15, and that's an important part also of why some patients become refractory. And it's important to make a distinction between gluten-free diet non-responsive, that's the patient who is on a diet but still continues to have symptoms and continues to have mucosal damage, versus refractory celiac. Refractory celiac is a type of 
lymphoma, it's a cancer, is when the intraepithelial lymphocytes, which are these cells here in the center, when these cells become malignant, they become a cancer. That's refractory celiac. And that's only one in 200 patients, fortunately, is not very common. So a few years ago, as, as was mentioned earlier, there were four companies <coughs> developing drugs for celiac, and they were acting at different stages. Uh, our uh, colleagues at Alvine, Chaitan Koshla, and his collaborators were developing glutenases to digest gluten, and that work now is carried out by Jennifer and Jack, and Jack will speak about the work done by Immunogenics. Wendy Perro is going to tell you about ALBA, the peptide that reduces intestinal permeability to gluten, uh, the work now carried out by Innovate. Chemocentrics was developing an immune modulator, which didn't work. And then Bob Anderson and, uh, and his co-workers at Immusanti were developing Nexfax2, and, uh, a vaccine to desensitize patients against gluten. So just four therapeutic approaches. But now we have an explosion of companies and groups acting at every single level, every single step of the cascade of events in celiac. And this is really, really important. I'm not going to go through all of this because we don't have time, but you, I'll leave the slides and you can, you can have the slides. And if you have any questions, you can email me. The message I will just share is that we need hundreds of drugs in preclinical stages to have one FDA-approved drug. And it's very important that we have at least five to 10 drugs in clinical trials at any given time if we want to increase the odds of having one drug approved. And it's very important that they all work at different <coughs> aspects of the mechanism because we are not going to cure celiac with a single drug. It's a complex disease. We are going to need combinations. So the um, work that we do at Cell Immune is to um, focus on interleukin-15. Interleukin-15 is a cytokine, uh, an immune molecule, which was proven to be a central regulator in celiac and in refractory celiac disease. There are dozens of publications which are summarized in this slide. Um, Bana Jabri and uh, French investigators primarily found that interleukin-15 is important in the loss of the tolerance that the body has to gluten. It's very important in the activation of the intraepithelial lymphocytes. And it's also the main reason for refractory celiac disease and intestinal T-cell lymphoma. There are really important publications showing that interleukin-15 is the main driver of intraepithelial lymphocyte activation and malignization. So we were very fortunate that Amgen, who is the, probably the best manufacturer of biologic drugs, and interleukin-15 is an antibody. It's a biologic drug. Amgen was developing AMG714 for rheumatoid arthritis. They did several studies, and the drug appeared to be safe and effective. We asked Amgen if they would allow us to test AMG714 in celiac disease, because we knew interleukin-15 is important, and they have a drug that blocks interleukin-15. So why not test it in celiac? We, um, reviewed with them the excellent efficacy in rheumatoid arthritis with 60% response rate and with clear biomarker improvement across several um, important endpoints. We looked at the safety profile and they agreed after seeing results done by the French group, Dr. Selier, in, in vitro, Dr. Selier had, had taken biopsies from patients with refractory celiac on the left and active celiac on the right. And when he incubated those biopsies with AMG714, the intraepithelial lymphocytes would die. They would stop growing. So this was really great evidence that this drug had promise in celiac. So then we 
conducted first a clinical trial called Selim NRCD001, and it's a gluten challenge. As you know, gluten challenges are not fun, but it is the best way to test if a drug works, because you have a group of celiac volunteers who have been on a gluten-free diet for a long time. They have a normal mucosa, and they accept to be exposed to gluten, in this case for 10 weeks, two and a half grams a day. <laughs> but if, if the drug really works against this amount of gluten for this amount of time, then it's worth continuing the development. It's a very definitive test. We had two doses of drug, and this drug is an injection that patients do at home in the future. They will be able to do at home subcutaneous injection like insulin, and probably either every two weeks or every four weeks. So it will be very convenient. If you only need to inject yourself 12 times a year, and this could protect you from contamination, that is why these patients agreed to volunteer, because of the potential benefits for the community. This trial was done in Finland entirely with Marco Maki and his collaborators, and we had a biopsy at the beginning and at the end. And we also had a group of patients in this trial who did not get the gluten challenge, but rather were followed for their normal, so quote unquote, normal contamination, so just contamination events in their diet. And we monitored them thanks to gluten detective and biometals tests. So this was very important for us to actually be able to tell when patients were taking the gluten challenge. We also found patients who said they were taking it and they were just flushing it down the toilet because they didn't want to take it anymore, but we could measure that as well. So that was our first study, the gluten challenge. We did a second trial for extremely sick patients with refractory celiac, patients who had a lymphoma in their gut after decades of contamination with gluten. That's why it's so important to avoid gluten, because if not, you end up developing refractory celiac. We conducted this trial in, in five countries, in the US, Dr. Crow and Dr. Green in New York uh, helped um, a group of investigators in, in the Netherlands, in France, Spain. And uh, we tested the, the drug this time intravenously because we wanted a very high dose. So it was an infusion, intravenous infusion of AMG714. The results were very favorable. We found that AMG714 displayed efficacy on multiple endpoints with acceptable safety in both trials, in celiac disease and in refractory celiac. We confirmed all the work done before us in the indicating that interleukin-15 is a key mediator in the pathophysiology of celiac and refractory celiac. We had consistent efficacy on symptoms, on inflammation, and in the case of refractory celiac, on the T cell clonality, which is an indicator of the malignity. We did not see a primary significant endpoint, but the results were clear across multiple endpoints. And because of that, Digestive Disease Week, which is the most important gastrointestinal conference in the world, has decided to display the data at some prominent presentations. On June 4th, there will be an oral presentation of the gluten challenge, and on the same day, the refractory trial will be presented at the presidential plenary. But because of this, I cannot show you the data today. <laughs> Unfortunately, Digestive Disease Week imposes an embargo on the data until June 4th. So I, I apologize, but all I could share is what, what you have here. Cell Immune was acquired by Amgen. Now it's a wholly owned subsidiary. And Amgen, who is an incredibly ethical company, decided to offer expanded access of this drug to patients who desperately need it with refractory celiac. So now we are working, planning for the next trials, a phase 2B trial as an adjunct to a gluten-free diet, 
in a phase three trial for refractory celiac disease. So this is the work of hundreds of people, literally. If we started to thank everybody who participated, it would be hundreds of people. Investigators, nurses, laboratory personnel across multiple countries in Amgen, Salomon, and other companies. But I want to mention CDF because we did use the iCure celiac registry to interrogate the registry looking for patients for our trial, and that was of great help. And it's really, really important that patients sign up and share their data so that it can be mined, it can be analyzed, and it can contribute to finding new medications. So thank you very much, especially to all the volunteers, volunteers for the registry, for volunteers for the trial. You are the, the real heroes that make all of this possible. Thank you.